give a second lecture on rigid co-cycles and real quadratic singular moduli. All right, thanks very much, Jen. And uh, thanks for being back, especially at this early hour. I uh, really appreciate your being here. Uh, so today, we have to do a little bit of work. So last time was mainly motivational. Today, I have to tell you the main construction in this whole area. So we have to uh, get through quite a bit of material. And then next time, we'll just have some fun. So I hope to get through all of it today. Um, I put everything on slides just because there's quite a few definitions and I want things to be as clear as possible. Uh, and also, my handwriting apparently was quite small last time. So I hope uh, that by making slides, I could uh, remedy this. So I put everything on slides. I chose the smallest font that Beamer would let me. And here is uh, the result. OK, so let's start with a, a brief recap. Last time, uh, after this uh, letter of Zagier that we read and where we got all into the mood of the theme of this conference, we started discussing quadratic forms A, B, C. Uh, so th those are polynomials homogeneous of degree 2 with integer coefficients. And we studied the action of SL2Z that exists on these quadratic forms. Now, uh, this is a photograph of uh, Hendrik Lenstra looking uh, uh, quite unimpressed. Now, why is he unimpressed? Last time, I made a definition, uh, and I let FD be the set of primitive forms of discriminant D, defined to be B squared minus 4AC. And of course, it's my constitutional right to make any definition I like. But a little bit later, I made a claim, which is not quite true unless I put in that additional condition there that A needs to be bigger than 0 if D is less than 0. So let me do that now and make up for that. Oh, hey. <laughs> Uh, and the statement was the following. So we saw that if we looked at these, the set FD up to SL2Z equivalence, we got a finite set. Not only did we get a finite set, we could put it in bijection with a finite abelian group. So it inherits also a group structure. And the explicit bijection was given by this uh, particular map. Now, this is the collection of the different SL2Z orbits. And we'll be delving into one specific SL2Z orbit. And so we'll be interested in what's happening inside of this orbit and what kind of structures we can find there. And people have found a lot of amazing structure there. For the purposes of these lectures, um, we'll only need very basic concepts. And a notable one is the notion of reducedness. And so we call, we try and identify distinguished representatives for these SL2Z equivalence classes, uh, inside of an SL2Z equivalence class. And we take these reduced forms, which when d is negative, is defined by this pair of inequalities where b is uh, non-negative if either inequality is an equality. Uh, in terms of the first root we defined last time attached to a quadratic form, this condition is equivalent to saying that the first root is in the standard fundamental domain for SL2Z in the upper half plane. Now, more interestingly, and that's really what uh, the case that we'll, uh, that we'll be looking at, when d is bigger than 0, we will define a quadratic form to be nearly reduced if a and c have opposite signs. So if a times c is less than 0, and we'll say it's reduced if, in addition to that condition, also b is greater than a plus c in absolute value. Okay? Now, this, this is a little bit different uh, from the condition of reducedness that you usually find in the literature. Uh, so uh, Gauss and many other people like him uh, would have defined reduced forms by the following pair of inequalities, so that square root of d minus twice the absolute value of a should be less than b, should be less than the square root of d. Uh, this condition here looks, uh, well, I think a little bit simpler. You don't really see it in the literature. I don't really know why, but they're entirely equivalent. And this is a, a problem that you find in the lecture notes. Yes, absolutely. Ah, but it won't necessarily be in the same equivalence class. So you can apply the matrix S, which changes A and C, but it also negates the sign of B, and that violates the second condition. So that's why it's not quite symmetric. Yeah, but it's a great question. Yeah. So uh, in addition, I also threw this uh, thing at you without explaining it too much, but I saw in the exercise sessions that a lot of you were 
um, looking, getting deeper into this topograph, so I wanted to quickly mention it again. So the topograph, maybe it's not for you, you might be perfectly happy with the algebraic approach. It's a, it's a way to conveniently visualize the entire SL2Z orbit of a single quadratic form. And so this topograph is a tree, and the quadratic forms in a SL2Z orbit, they correspond, they're in one-to-one -one correspondence with the oriented edges of this tree. So for instance, if I take the middle, the left picture, the oriented edge going up, right in the middle, I can read off the coefficients of the quadratic form. A is on my left, that's one. C is on my right, that's two. And B is going to be the number in front of me, which is three, minus the sum of the numbers next to me. So that's three minus one plus two, which is zero. And that's the middle coefficient of this. And so on the right, uh, we have an indefinite form. And an indefinite form, of course, represents both positive and negative numbers. So there's a boundary between the regions where it's positive and it's negative, and that's what Conway calls the river. And so the nearly reduced forms are precisely the forms that correspond to oriented edges on this river. Okay? You can think also about what reducedness translates to in this visual picture of the topograph. I'll give you a hint, it has something to do with the side rivers branching out either to the left or to the right, and when they switch sides, you'll have precisely one reduced form at that edge. Okay, so today um, we're going to start talking about co-cycles, and I'd like to begin by making a couple of definitions. So uh, these definitions are quite formal, and they look a little bit strange maybe the first time you see them, but bear with me. Uh, there is a payoff, which I'll get to next time, and hopefully I can give you a little glimpse at the end of today's lecture if I uh, get that far. So we'll consider the additive group of rational functions. Uh, so CZ, Z will be the name of the variable that I'll consider. And I'll make that into a module over GL2Q. I'll use left modules throughout uh, today's talk. If you prefer right modules, you just uh, have to make your own adjustments. A matrix ABCD will act on a rational function by the, the weight 2 action. So that's the determinant times this factor minus CZ plus A raised to the power minus 2. And then F, where the argument is translated by a linear fractional transformation by the adjoint of the matrix that we started with. So this is the usual uh, action that you see also for modular forms, except in most textbooks, traditionally, this is done with a right action, uh, so everything is uh, the same up to an adjoint. Now, what we'll want to consider is the rational co-cycle. So it's a group of rational co-cycles, uh, by which I will mean elements of Z1, so one co-cycles, for the group SL2Z valued in CZ. So that's this additive group of rational functions on P1C. And if you are unfamiliar with this notation, let's give a very concrete characterization of such elements. Such elements will be crossed homomorphisms, so they will be maps from SL2Z to CZ. Not just any maps, these maps have to satisfy this identity for all gamma 1 and gamma 2 in SL2Z. It should be true that if I take phi of the product, it is phi of gamma 1 plus gamma 1 acting in this way that I've just defined on phi of gamma 2. Yeah. So these will be the objects that I'll want to consider. Of course, I can make any definition I like. Uh, and since this is not something you may have uh, encountered before, let me give you an example. And let's start with an example that's not terribly interesting, but it's still very instructive to work through, especially maybe if you want to implement all of the uh, knowledge that you've gained throughout of this workshop, these things are very nice to implement also on a computer and to play around with a little bit to get a feeling for how they work. Or by hand, whatever you prefer. So here's a toy example. The definition of this toy example depends on an auxiliary choice of a cusp. Yeah, so a cusp for me will be an element of P1Q. So it's a pair of rational numbers well-defined up to multiplication, so up to a scalar. And here's the definition of this co-cycle. So I'll call it P sub C. I didn't really know what, uh, what a good name for it would be. Uh, the sub C indicates the dependence on this cusp C. And it's a map that sends a matrix gamma to the difference of two rational functions. So I have my matrix gamma here, and I send that to the difference of these two rational functions, where that rational function is defined in this way. So you see it's a, it's a rational function that takes these coordinates, R and S, and it puts s in the numerator and sz minus r in the denominator. Yeah. Of course, r and s were well defined up to a scalar, but the definition of lc is independent of that scalar. Yes? Okay, bizarre definition. But it turns out that this is a co-cycle. 
There is also this additional choice of a cusp that went into the definition, but it turns out, and this is also very easy to show, that it only changes the result up to a co-boundary. Yes? So this co-cycle doesn't really depend in an essential way on C, only up to a co-boundary it does. So we understand very well the ambiguity in making this choice. Now, why is it a co-cycle? I can claim this. Uh, this is also one of the exercises. There's uh, lots of exercises on these uh, examples in the notes. Uh, I'll give you three ways to check that this is a co-cycle. So the first is by a direct calculation. So if this is your preferred method, there is no shame in that. Just work out the identity, verify that it checks out through a calculation. The most direct and seems very satisfying uh, approach to showing that this is a co-cycle, but we'd like a little bit more because we'll identify also other co-cycles where these calculations become so horrible that we probably don't want to do them anymore. Now, some of you in the audience will know that this is a co-cycle without doing this calculation. And they'll know, they'll prove it by, by memory. Because they'll remember when they took a course on modular forms and they defined Eisenstein series, that when you define Eisenstein series in the usual way, and you specialize to weight two, it's that you don't have absolute convergence anymore. And when you have a lack of absolute convergence, the transformation law doesn't let you rearrange things in the usual way, and you find that E2, the Eisenstein series of weight two, is invariant under the action of gamma up to this error term, which is precisely the co-cycle that I've defined for you. No? So more precisely, so E2z, if you, if you slash that, and here I'm using the, the right action that you usually find in the literature of weight two, by gamma minus one, if this was an honest modular form, you would get zero, but you don't get zero. You get, in fact, the co-cycle P infinity gamma inverse, where infinity is a particular choice for the cusp, so one comma zero. And the gamma inverse is there because, well, because I have a right action on the left, so I need a right action on the right, but I had a left action in the definition, so that's why the inverse is there. So that was a lot of lefts and rights, so I hope that wasn't too confusing. From this formal identity, it follows entirely uh, formally, that this is a co-cycle without doing any laborious calculation. Then there is a final way to check that it's a co-cycle, and this is really the way that we'll prefer, but I have to make a small definition first. So uh, if M is any SL2Z module, a modular symbol, usually people uh, in the literature have slightly less stringent conditions than the ones I'll put, so they might call this an invariant modular symbol, it's going to be a map that takes a pair of cusps and sends it to an element in this module M. Yeah. But it's not just any map, it has to satisfy some conditions. And I, I apologize for the notation if some people don't like this, but it's entirely traditional to use these set brackets for the arguments of a modular symbol. I don't know why, but this is how, how, this, uh, how the literature works. Now these are the conditions that I want to demand on my modular symbol. So M of R comma S, a pair of cusps R and S, is going to be minus M S comma R. So it's anti-symmetric in the arguments S and R, the cusps that I take. Moreover, it's additive in the arguments, and that's what this condition here, it's a very important condition, uh, here at the bottom uh, says, if I go from R to T, if I take the pair R and T, or I take the pair R and S and the pair S and T, and I add them up, I get the same answer, uh, the same element of my module M. Then the condition on the right, that's the one that uh, indicates the invariance, uh, that's, uh, that says that this modular symbol interacts well with the action of SL2Z that I have both on M, because that's a SL2Z module, and on the cusps, because there we already have an SL2Z action. And I want this to be equivariant in precisely this way that's on the slide there. Yeah? Okay, very strange. Uh, you, you may have encountered many modular symbols in your life, um, now, what's convenient about these modular symbols is that if you have such a map, if you have such a modular symbol that satisfies these axioms, and you take any cusp C, then the map that sends gamma to M of C comma gamma C is a one co-cycle. This is very easy to check. Yeah. So if we could only identify this PC as a special case of this, if we could construct some modular symbol that does precisely this and that is obviously additive and anti-symmetric and gamma invariant, you wouldn't have anything to prove at all. So I'll leave that on the slide and it's an exercise to make this uh, a reality and to check that this is a co-cycle in this way. Whichever method you prefer, but the third one's the best. Okay, 
Now, besides this toy co-cycle that we had, which came from a Weight 2 Eisenstein series, we won't have much use for this co-cycle. We'll actually be interested in other examples that live inside of this group of rational co-cycles. And they were constructed for the first time in the late 70s by Marvin Knopp. Now, the definition is a little bit involved. So I want to take some time uh, to walk you through it. And the first thing we're going to do is, just like before, we're going to choose a cusp. So C is going to be an auxiliary element in P1Q. And in addition to that, there's an additional piece of input, and that's going to be a hyperbolic quadratic form. Yeah? So I'll take a discriminant that is not a square, and I'll take F to be the uh, element of this set FD that I define. So it's a quadratic form of discriminant D in particular, and that will be part of my input for the co-cycle. Okay? So what is the co-cycle? Here it is. So let's take some time to parse uh, this definition. So I'll denote it by Kn sub Cf. The sub denotes, uh, so reflects the, the dependencies here, and the Kn, I guess, refers to Knopp. It sends a matrix gamma to a sum where the sum is indexed by all of the elements in the SL2z orbit of F. That's the tilde notation I had also last time. So Q in the SL2z orbit of F is another way of phrasing that subscript of the sum. Yeah? So, a priori, it's an infinite sum. Yeah? It's an infinite orbit. But what am I going to sum over? I'm going to sum over a rational function whose numerator I have to explain entirely to you. So let's put a pin in that and return to that in a second. And the denominator, actually, we can already appreciate what that means. So z is our variable, and rq is the first root of the quadratic form q that we're summing over. So I'll remind you, the first root last time of a quadratic form ABC, we defined by minus B plus square root of D divided by 2A. Okay? Now, the only mystery is in this numerator. What is this complicated sine C comma Q of gamma? Here's what it is. The numerator of this expression is going to be, well, as the name suggests, a sine. So it's going to be minus 1, 1, or 0, depending on the following conditions. So if I take my quadratic form and I evaluate it at the cusp C, which was my auxiliary output, input, sorry, and that's less than zero, and that in turn is less than Q of gamma acting on C, then I return minus one. If I get that they have opposite signs but the inequalities are in the other direction, then I get plus one. And if neither of these conditions are satisfied, I just return zero. So that's what this sine function is. Uh, it's a lot to parse, uh, and of course everything is entirely algebraic, but there's also maybe a, a more visual way of thinking about this. And it's to have this picture of intersecting geodesics in mind. So what you can do is when you have your quadratic form Q, it has two roots. It has a first and second root, which we denoted by RQ and R prime Q, respectively. If I draw those on P1 of R, and I have the upper half plane sitting above it, I get a geodesic from the second root to the first root, which I've denoted here, I've uh, um, rendered here in red. So it's oriented from R prime Q to RQ. That's a geodesic, it's a semicircle. I can do the same with the cusp C and make the geodesic to gamma of C, the gamma translate of C, and that gives me a second geodesic. And I'm going to choose the usual right-hand ori orientation on the upper half plane, and I'm just going to compute the intersection number of these two geodesics. So that means I follow the red with my index finger, and then my middle finger will be the, the black geodesic, and if it's pointing up, then I get a 1, and if it's pointing down, I get a minus 1. And if they don't intersect, I return 0. No? So it's an intersection of two geodesics defined in this way. Okay. Now, what a bizarre definition, right? Uh, and the first time you see it, I mean, it's like this whole business with co-cycles, it's, like it's like a fungus, you know? And the first time you see it, you're like, well, what's, what's this? But then, you know, the fungus, like, it grows, and, you know, you kind of learn to appreciate the fungus, and you get used to it, and ultimately, you lo love the fungus. And so this, uh, this co-cycle, it takes some time to parse. But I think the best way to engage with it is to really verify all of the properties that I'm about to put on this slide. Yeah? And this is also in the exercises. And try and do this in the, in the optimal way. That really gives you some insight as to why this definition, why on earth you would make this definition. So the first thing you would have to check is that it's well-defined, right? I'm trying to map to the rational functions, and I've written an infinite sum there, so that sum had better be a, secretly a finite sum, meaning that the sign condition is only non-zero for all but finitely many terms in this sum. Okay, that's the first thing you need to check, which is in the exercises. <coughs> 
Once you've checked that and you know that the map makes sense, you have to verify that this is a co-cycle. And I've given you three methods to do that, so you can choose your favorite method to try and verify this. Either you do this by a direct calculation, as you see sometimes done in the literature, but uh, you might have quite a bit more gray hairs at the end of this workshop if you, if you choose this method. But, you know, it's, it's your right to do that if, if you choose to do that. The second method, constructing this modular integral, so finding the analog of the E2, that's probably the hardest. You should save that one for last. Uh, in fact, Yuki Mamoglu and Toth uh, have an annals paper where they construct this form, so it's, it's a pretty difficult uh, problem. The last one, however, so the method using modular symbols, is I think by far the best method to check that this is a co-cycle because it gives you some insight as to why on earth this definition works. Yeah? Why on earth this miraculous expression is indeed a co-cycle. And it comes from the additivity of intersection numbers of geodesics. So the crucial thing to check is that when you define the modular symbol, it's additive. And if you have three geodesics yeah, between R and S, S and T, and then R and T, and you intersect with some other geodesics, then the intersection numbers are going to add up between the three. Yeah. So if you, if you intersect one, then you have to intersect another with the opposite sign, so they have to cancel out. And that's kind of the idea. I don't want to give away the exercise, but that's really um, the idea to check, and it gives you some insight as to why this definition works and what makes it tick. Once you've checked that it's a co-cycle, all the other properties are easy to check. So like before, the auxiliary input of this cusp doesn't really matter much. So in fact, if I choose a different cusp, I will only have changed the answer up to a co-boundary. So another way of saying that is that the cohomology class is completely well-defined and independent of the cusp C. Now, finally, since we know that the choice of cusp doesn't really matter all that much, a natural choice to take is the cusp infinity. Yeah, why not? I mean, this seems to be the most obvious choice. If we do that, we get a co-cycle knop F. And a co-cycle, it's a lot of data, because for every matrix, it's a rational function, and it satisfies this co-cycle condition. Now, SL2Z has two very convenient generators, yeah, which I think uh, we put also on the board last time. I had some big chalk, which, ah, here it is. Uh, so it's, uh, so SL2Z is generated by the matrix S, which is minus 1, 1, and then zeros on the diagonal. And then you also have the matrix T, which is a translation matrix, 1, 1, 1, uh, like this. And if I know what the co-cycle does on these generators, I can figure out through these identities what it is on any matrix. Yeah? So it's enough for me to tell you what the co-cycle does on these generators. If I choose the cusp infinity, then I see that gamma, so C and gamma C are the same for the matrix T. The translation doesn't change the cusp infinity. So this intersection number is always zero. So the matrix T just gets sent to zero. That's what parabolic means. Yeah? Parabolic, here I put in orange, that means the same as that condition there, that the co-cycle vanishes on T. By the way, whenever I choose the cusp infinity, I'm going to drop the subscript C from the notation to make it a little bit lighter. Yeah? So when you don't see the C in the notation, that means I've chosen the cusp infinity. That's my canonical choice. Now, on the matrix S, however, this is not going to be trivial, otherwise this wouldn't be a very interesting uh, example. On the matrix S, if we translate these conditions, we see that we go from infinity to S of infinity, which is zero. So that's a geodesic that the black geodesic is just going down. It's like a vertical line. Yeah? And then this condition of intersecting is entirely the same as saying that the roots have opposite signs. And one of them is positive and the other is negative. That determines the sign of this thing. So if you plug everything into this definition for the matrix S and the choice of cusp infinity, you get precisely this, where you see that the sum now is replaced by Q inside of the set of nearly reduced forms. So these distinguished elements that we found in the SL2Z orbit, that's what we'll index over. That's a finite set, by the way. Yeah? So here we see this is indeed finite, which was something you had to check for every gamma. But for this particular gamma being S, this is indeed finite. I've defined it here on the slide again. So this sigma F is a set of nearly reduced forms. It's ABC in the orbit of F, such that A and C have opposite signs. Yeah? OK, so this is the rational function that we get uh, sent to. And of course, last time I gave you a reduction algorithm. And I know that some of you have been computing some of these nearly reduced forms in a given orbit. You can compute this. Yeah? So in any given example, you now have the power to find out what this rational function is. The only thing that's not clear to you yet is why on earth you would do this. So that's what I have to deliver on. And uh, next time will be the big payoff of all of these definitions. OK? All right. Uh, any questions about this before I move on?
Yeah, that's a great question. I, I never, I mean, I never met Knopp, so I, I can't be sure. But my impression is that his paper was entirely curiosity-based. So what he was, his starting point was uh, the theorem of Eichler Shimura, which gives a way of thinking of modular forms in terms of their period polynomials. So elements also in these cohomology groups, but with values in spaces of polynomials with a very similar transformation law, but where the weight has the opposite sign. And so what he did is he said, we look at these cohomology groups to study modular forms. That's what Eichler Shimura tells us to do. And if I, if I naively change the weight to a negative one, oh, I don't have any modular forms anymore, but I can still look at these co-cycles. And of course, polynomials doesn't make sense anymore with a negative weight. He then had to change the rational functions, and he wrote down lots of these examples. Yeah? So uh, as far as I can tell, that was the main motivation. But I can't be sure because I, I never knew uh, Knopp. Now, uh, let me give you a very quick, let's see how I'm doing on time, okay. A very quick example, um, so when the discriminant d is 5, there's a unique SL2z orbit of quadratic forms. Uh, f being 1, 1, 1, minus 1 is an element in there. And the set of nearly reduced forms you can very quickly work out. You don't have to, have to program anything. Uh, just from the conditions, you see that everything has to have absolute value 1, and so you have a finite number of possibilities. Uh, and this is all of them. So there's four elements in this set of nearly reduced forms. And so the Knopf co-cycle, okay, I, okay, this is, uh, so this is true up to square root of 5. I forgot. The, the right-hand side should be multiplied by square root of 5. I apologize for that. I'll correct that on the slides. Anyway, it doesn't really matter. It's a scalar. The essential part of the rational function is there on the right-hand side. It's a very nice rational function. And it happens to be the value of this co-cycle at S. If you make this computation, of course, you want to check that you did this properly and that this really works. And of course, the fact that it's the value of a parabolic co-cycle at S puts some really strong conditions on this particular rational function. So you can think about this as also an exercise. It translates because, of course, the, the S and T have various relations existing between them. And so if you go back to the presentation of SL2Z uh, in terms of SLT with the relations that they satisfy, that translates into the following transformation laws for this particular rational function. So they're really strong. That's what I'm uh, trying to say. You have to satisfy really both of these transformation laws. So the first is if you hit it with the left action by 1 plus s, so you hit it by 1, you add uh, the action of s, you get 0. And the same you do when, when you hit it with the matrix st, which is of order 6 in SL2z. And you do just with the power to the 0 power, the first power and the second power, and you add them all up, you also get 0. So these are very strong conditions that these things must satisfy. Uh, and if you check those, for instance, once you have computed your example, you're very confident that you got it right. In fact, any rational function satisfying these two identities is the special value of uh, a co-cycle at S, of a parabolic co-cycle, I should say, at S. Okay, so that's an example. I just wanted to briefly mention, so you can forget everything on this slide, just as a, for a little bit of extra motivation, because I know that these definitions look a little bit strange. And so what Jordan was asking, I, I want to kind of maybe continue along that thread, because there's another motivation for considering such co-cycles, which came much later, and that's in fact wh where we learned about the existence of these co-cycles. It comes from this recent work of Duke, Imamoglu, and Toth on linking numbers of modular geodesics. It's a beautiful paper, and what's happening in that paper is the following. So you can take SL2R, and it's a nice, uh, it's, it's a threefold, you view it as a threefold, and you quotient out by the arithmetic subgroup SL2Z. Now there's a very classical result that says that this threefold is diffeomorphic to a three sphere with a trefoil knot removed. Yeah. Uh, and so in this three sphere with a trefoil knot removed, there's a very nice flow on this threefold, and it's called it's a so-called diagonal geodesic flow. Now, I'm not going to use it in the lectures. This is entirely just to, to show you that these co-cycles are good for something uh, before I tell you that they're good for something else as well. But initially, this is where we learned about this. Whenever you have a hyperbolic matrix in SL2Z, you can associate a canonical knot inside of this threefold by following this diagonal geodesic flow. It doesn't really matter so much what it is. I've put the definition on the slide. So you start with your matrix, gamma. You diagonalize it with some matrix G. That's what this thing here. On the, on the right is, so you diagonalize it with this matrix G, and then you put this matrix G here, uh, and you consider the coset of SL2Z of G times E to the T, E to the minus T. And you see that when T is zero, and T increases all the way to the logarithm of the first eigenvalue of this matrix, you can flip them around and you see that you end up where you started. So you get a, you get a, a periodic orbit this way, and so you get a closed loop inside of this threefold. And so if you see this picture, a very natural question to ask is, What's the linking number between this hyperbolic knot and the trefoil knot? 
And this is a question that was raised and answered uh, by Etienne Gis in his uh, ICM address, I think in 2002. Uh, he wrote, a, maybe 2006, I'm sorry, I, I can't remember exactly. I think, yeah, maybe it was 2006. He uh, raised and answered this question, a very, very nice uh, talk that he gave. And he showed, actually, that the linking number is encoded in the logarithm of this toy cocycle P that we started off with, this innocuous-looking thing that came from the lack of invariance of the Eisenstein series of weight 2. Um, so the logarithm of that keeps track of this. You can squeeze out the linking number in a very concrete way that I won't uh, tell you about now. Now, a very natural follow-up question, which is a question that Duke Momoglu and Toth asked, is forget about the trefoil. If I take a pair of hyperbolic matrices, I get a pair of knots in this, tref in this uh, threefold, and I can ask what their linking number with each other is. And the answer to that question, what the linking number with each other is, seems to be encoded in precisely the same way as in the work of Gis, but using this much more involved Knopp co-cycle. So this is one other instance of where this Knopp co-cycle was, uh, was used for, for, something, for something quite productive. Uh, and that's where we learned also about its existence. So I just wanted to mention that in both cases, the procedure for getting from the co-cycle to the linking number involves some integration procedure, and that's precisely what we'll do next also. Now, the integration procedure that we consider is quite different from the one that they consider. We have a multiplicative integration. They have an additive one. But nonetheless, there are many similarities that, uh, that happen between these two works. Okay, so let me tell you back to, uh, after this motivational slide, we had our additive co-cycles. We have two interesting examples. Well, in fact, we have infinitely many interesting examples. We had the toy co-cycle, and then we had all the Knopp co-cycles for all of the hyperbolic quadratic forms that we could take. What we'll do now is we'll consider also the multiplicative group of non-zero rational functions on P1. Yeah? So these are elements in the function field of P1 of C that are not zero, and they are a left GL2Q module for the weight zero action. Yeah. So here's the action. So it's just acting by the adjoint on the linear fra fractional transformations on the argument of the function f. Now the connection between the additive and the multiplicative co-cycle is furnished by the following uh, map. It's a, what's traditionally called the logarithmic derivative map. And it takes one of these multiplicative functions and it maps it to an additive function by sending a function f to its derivative divided by the function itself. Now, this is, this is a morphism. Yeah? Uh, multiplication turns into addition. And it's, it also respects the action of GL2Q that I defined on both sides, the weight 0 on multiplicative, weight 2 on additive co-cycles. Now, the kernel of this map is precisely the constant functions C star. And note something quite funny is that both of the examples that we wrote down are valued in the image of this logarithmic derivative map. Meaning that the functions we wrote down, where we send gamma to, they all have a very specific shape. They're always uh, of the form of elementary factors that have a simple pole. And so therefore, they naturally arise in the image of this. In fact, I can write down how they're in the image of this completely explicitly. So if I map gamma, so this function L, if I map that to Z minus gamma infinity to be my cusp, but again, with the usual conventions of this L function that I had last time. And I can do the same with the Knopp code cycle, where this sum that I had is now changed to a product where the numerator in these elementary uh, fractions, which was always plus or minus 1, has now become the exponent of these factors. Yeah? And just entirely formally, I haven't done any mathematics here, if I apply the D log, to this product, I get precisely the sum that defines for me the Knopp co-cycle. Yeah? So it's entirely formal to see that the expressions that I wrote down allow for such a lift for the logarithmic derivative map. As a consequence, these particular maps that I've written down here are actually co-cycles, but they're only co-cycles modulo scalars, yeah? because that's the way the D-log map works. It has a kernel which is scalars. And so if I write down this formal map, I know that it's going to satisfy the co-cycle conditions up to some scalar. Okay. Can we do better? Is the question. Can we get rid of this scalar ambiguity? I know there are co-cycles up to scalars. Can I make them actual co-cycles valued in Cz star? So in other words, instead of these naive, stupid lifts that I wrote down, can I tinker my constants in such a way for every matrix gamma that they satisfy the co-cycle condition on the nose without any scalar ambiguity? 
That's a natural question to ask. The answer is yes. And the reason is that the group SL2Z is, is not so rich, uh, cohomologically speaking. So here's a, a little lemma. Um, I have to explain what this lemma means. So let's start on the right-hand side. These are co-cycles, so forget the 12 for the second. These are co-cycles. The subscript par denotes parabolic co-cycles. So those are co-cycles that vanish on the group of translations inside of SL2Z. The co-cycles for SL2Z valued in CZ star over C star. So those are the objects that we have. We would like to lift them to actual co-cycles valued in CZ star. Uh, now, of course, you have a natural map from CZ star to CZ star modulo scalars, just by taking the co-cycle modulo scalars. And all of the elements, all of the co-cycles that become parabolic modulo scalars, I'll denote with this subscript F on the left-hand side. Yeah? So the, it, I mean, the, the existence of the map is really the, the definition of this subscript F. So it's all of the co-cycles that become parabolic modulo scalars. So if I do that, if I take that projection map, so I forget the scalars, I take everything projectively, that's actually an isomorphism, or at least it's an isomorphism if I remember to raise everything to the 12th power, yeah. so if I multiply everything by 12. So this lemma really is telling us there's no real difference. If I have a parabolic co-cycle, it actually lifts uniquely, after I take the 12th power, to an actual co-cycle with values in CZ. Uh, so I'll, I'll leave the proof as an exercise. Uh, I'll, give you, I'll give you the idea, though. So the idea is to start with, oops, with uh, a short exact sequence, which I think no one will object to, and passing to the associated long exact sequence, in cohomology, so group cohomology for the group SL2Z. And that shows you that the group that we actually want to be a part of maps to the group where we found some classes defined by the co-cycles that we wrote down there. So this is modulo scalars. And this maps, in turn, to an H2 of SL2Z with values in C star. Oops, oops, that's not good. Did that make a huge racket? No. Okay. Can you still hear me? Okay, great. Sorry about that. Now there's a kernel also to this map. And this comes from the group H1 SL2Z C star. So to prove this lemma, the first thing you're going to do is to show that this group is zero, and this group is torsion. So it's cyclic of order 12. And you can use the usual presentation of SL2Z to prove this. So this is the first part of this exercise. So that shows, actually, that once you multiply by 12, you get an isomorphism between these cohomology groups. Now, the lemma is stated in terms of co-cycles, and not just their cohomology classes. So you need an additional ingredient at the end. And that is that, you see, when I have a parabolic co-cycle, and I look at its cohomology class, I lose some information. So, but if I have a cohomology class that has a parabolic representative, it must have a unique such representative. And that's because there are no co-boundaries that are parabolic. Because co-boundaries that are parabolic, they would correspond, they would come from actual functions, rational functions whose divisor is invariant on the translation. And no such things exist besides constants, and therefore the co-boundaries must all be trivial. Yeah? So that's how you prove this lemma, and hopefully that uh, that gets you going to actually solve this exercise. Okay. Okay. So, with this lemma in hand, I can take my two examples that I have, and I can lift them multiplicatively, at least after I take them to the 12th power. So I take these co-cycles that I have there, modulo scalars, I raise them to the 12th power, I know I get a unique lift, and those unique lifts I'm going to call P upper times and knop f upper times. Yeah? So they're elements, they're co-cycles for SL2Z valued in CZ star, and they're parabolic modulo scalars, even though they're not necessarily parabolic themselves. And neither of them are, in fact. Okay, 
No, that's, that's a great question. Of course, you don't really need to take the 12th power. I'm doing it here to get the uniqueness statement. But in practice, actually, we, we don't do this. We're happy to live with this ambiguity of 12th roots of unity in practice, because in practice, later on, we'll try and recognize algebraic numbers that are absolutely massive. So we want to keep them as small as possible in height, and therefore, we often don't take this 12th power. But for theoretical purposes, let me just take it here to make the lift really unique. So everything is really now canonical with this 12th power. Otherwise, all these choices of lifts, I mean, the lift still exists because the H2 vanishes, but the choices of lifts, uh, there, it's like a principal homogeneous space for this H1 uh, of SL2ZC, which is cyclic of order 12. So you can only change it really through homomorphisms from SL2Z to C, of which there's a finite number. So if you're happy to live with that ambiguity, you don't have to take the 12th power. So that's a great, great common. Okay, we're almost there, guys. So we started with our additive co-cycles. We lifted them to multiplicative co-cycles. And now what are we going to do with co-cycles? I mean, we started off this whole story with the J function and the arguments of the J function at CM points. And if you have a function, it's clear how to talk about values. But now I'm taking co-cycles. What's the value of a co-cycle? A co-cycle is a collection of functions. So what do I do to produce an actual number out of a co-cycle? And this is what we do. So we're going to uh, define a mechanism. It's a very simple mechanism. It looks a little bit bizarre, but it's really simple to uh, evaluate a multiplicative co-cycle at a, a hyperbolic form of non-squared discriminant uh, D that is positive. So let's call that form G. So G is going to be an FD with D greater than zero non-square. And a, a nice feature that such matrices, uh, that such forms rather, have is that their stabilizers in SL2Z are actually infinite cyclic modular torsion. You know? So there's always plus or minus one. And then you also have this free part. And the free part, there's a canonical generator for it, which people usually call the automorph of G. And so the automorph of G is defined by this, this uh, identity here, so gamma of G, which has entries that depend on the coefficients. I didn't write this. I should have written A, B, and C are the coefficients of G. I forgot to write this. A, B, and C are the coefficients of G. And then there's also this T and U. And T and U are going to be solutions to the Pell equation. Uh, Pell equation T squared minus D U squared equals 4. And in fact, for any solution to the Pell equation that you take, that matrix, gamma G, is in the stabilizer. And if I take the minimal solution, let me take the, the minimal positive solution to that Pell equation, I get actually a canonical generator for this stabilizer. And that's what people usually call the automorph. So solving Pell's equation is entirely equivalent to finding the stabilizer of uh, this form G in SL2Z. And in fact, it's also equivalent to applying the reduction algorithm that we did last time. So you'll quickly find that when you, um, when you compute this, I mean, you can try and solve the Pell's equation, or you can work with these cycles of nearly reduced forms. So if you once you have a reduced form, you can keep applying the reduction algorithm to get more and more reduced forms. But there's finitely many, so eventually you look back onto yourself, and the matrices that you used in the process to make this transformation will then be precisely this automorph. And if you, up to a power plus or minus one, I guess, but if you do it the right way, you get it on the nodes. Uh, and so that uh, algorithm, of course, in turn also is, again, equivalent to finding the continued fraction expansion of the first root of G. So all of these algorithms are essentially all equivalent, and you have the tools now to find uh, these things in practice. Okay? Now, why am I telling you this? I'm trying to evaluate a co-cycle. Oh, yes, question. Sorry? A non-split just means the discriminant is not a square. No. So it doesn't factor as uh, two linear forms. Yeah. No. Okay, now, back to our co-cycle. We take the co-cycle phi, which is a multiplicative co-cycle, any multiplicative co-cycle. The value of this co-cycle at the form G it's a co-cycle, so it eats matrices and it spits out functions. Yeah? The matrix that will feed it is precisely this automorph that we just computed. So once you feed it the automorph, it spits out a rational function, and that rational function I'm going to evaluate at the first root of G. Out comes a number, yes? If you consider infinity a number, because of course you're taking a rational co-cycle, so it could happen that you evaluate at a pole, in which case you get infinity. So you get a number or infinity, so a nice element of P1 of C out of this construction. Now, this looks a little bit bizarre, and you have to kind of take my word for it that this is a bona fide operation. One clue that you get that this definition might be a good definition 
is that in fact, this value that I've just defined for you is independent of the choice of G in its SL2Z equivalence class. Yeah? So if I change it to a different G that's equivalent to it, that doesn't affect the value. So that's already kind of nice. It has a good canonical feature that doesn't depend on this particular representative G that you chose. And that's in fact also why I chose to put this notation here with the, with the square bracket, you see, to evoke the sense of that it's only the equivalence class of G really in the Picard group that, that matters for this value. Okay. So for the examples that we have, and this is in the exercises, you can try and work out what are these values of these rational co-cycles co that we wrote down. And the answer is that for the toy co-cycle, what you get out is the 12th power of the fundamental unit in the order of discriminant D. No. Of course, the fundamental unit is only well-defined up to you know, signs and then it taking it inverse, but it it's precisely the one that corresponds to that choice of the Pell's equation that I made in the automorph. Yeah? It's the very canonical element inside of that order. Okay, so something vaguely arithmetic, not terribly interesting yet. For the Knopko cycle, you can do the same thing. And here I, I'm not really sure what to say about this number, other than that it's a number in the field that you get by joining the square roots of D1 and D2. So D1 is the discriminant of the form F that I use to define the co-cycle. And D2 is the discriminant of the form G that I use to evaluate that co-cycle. If these discriminants, for instance, are co-prime, which is the generic case that we'll be interested in, this is a biquadratic field. And what I've done here is I've defined a canonical element of this biquadratic field that depends only on the class of F, the SL2Z class of F, and the SL2Z class of G. That's about all I can tell you about this. I'm not really sure what else to make of this element um, in, this, uh, well, in this limited setup of rational functions. That's something to think about, I guess. But anyway, that's where it lives. So, in summary, nothing too terribly shocking has happened. We've made a bunch of definitions, and I just want to break it down before we move on. There are three steps. The first step is we constructed an SL2Z co-cycle valued in the additive group C of Z. Now, interesting here is in quotation marks because that, that hasn't been apparent yet. Uh, we've just made this definition. It looked like a vaguely interesting, miraculous uh, looking co-cycle, but why it's interesting remains to be seen. The second is to take that additive co-cycle, lift it to a multiplicative co-cycle, which we could do in a unique way because SL2Z had such limited cohomology. The final thing that we do is after we take the multiplicative lift, we evaluate it at a second quadratic form, or yeah, a, a form G with discriminant D, and the discriminant here has to be positive, and out comes a number. Yeah? So a co-cycle can be evaluated at such forms, but nowhere else. Right? So this, this evaluation procedure is very unique to these uh, real quadratic singularities, uh, so these Gs of this particular form. Okay? So those were the three steps that we went through. Okay, now, we've constructed an element of a biquadratic field with this Knopp co-cycle. It's not so clear what this element is good for or if it's even good for anything. But the motto, and that's what we'll see now, is that we will see that very specific piadic limits of these values actually converge to tremendously interesting algebraic numbers that exhibit a lot of similarities with the differences of singular moduli studied by Gross and Zagier. So this I'll try and convince you of next time. I first have to tell you how these piadic limits work. But this is the, the kind of motto, the rough version of what I'm about to tell you. We'll identify very specific piadic limits of these numbers that converge to interesting looking limits. Now the idea is, this is the setup we've been operating under. We've been looking at the action of SL2Z on CZ star. It was a left action that we defined by weight zero and out come these objects. What we'll do now is we'll enrich this situation uh, considerably by replacing this setup with a much richer group and a much richer module. The group that I'll choose is a group that was considered by Ihara in the 60s and by, of course by many other people, but there's, there's a good reason for singling him out in this work because a lot of the inspiration came from there. It's the group SL2Z1 over P. Still has a, a kind of a global flavor. I haven't completed anything. I've just inverted P in the arguments of my matrices, and I'm going to make that act not on rational functions on P1, but on meromorphic functions of the piadic upper half plane. That's what I'm going to do. So I have to tell you what that means. So M star 
will be the multiplicative group of non-zero meromorphic functions on the piadic upper half plane HP. Now, if you haven't seen the piadic upper half plane before, let me just give you a quick idea of how it works. And in fact, this pedestrian definition that I'll give you now will serve you uh, for all practical purposes. If you want to know more, um, it's a beautiful object about which you can say a lot. I think the best, if you're looking for a way to get into this topic of, of uh, the piadic upper half plane, which is good for many things, the best way in is probably these uh, Arizona Winter School notes from 2007 by Das Gupta and Teitelbaum. And if you're interested, actually, the travel library at the PCMI has a copy uh, in the office, so you can have a look there for the, the full story. So I'll, I'll only give you a very uh, half-baked uh, kind of version of it. And I'll say that the piadic upper half plane, it's defined as a limit of HP less than or equal to N. So I have to define now for you what this HP less than or equal to N is. And HP less than or equal to N is defined by these conditions. So it's pairs of elements in CP in P1, so up to a scalar, and I normalize it so that they're both integral in OCP and at least one of them is a unit. Yeah, that's what primitive means here on the left. So Z1, Z2 primitive. Now, I'll not take all of these pairs. I'll take all the ones that satisfy an additional condition, and it should be true for any uh, cusp R, S that I take, which I normalize to be integral and co-prime, these R and S, so they're co-prime integers that define a cusp in P1 of Q. And I want that inequality there to be satisfied for all cusps. Yeah? So this is the piadic absolute value of SZ1 plus RZ2 uh, has to be at least P to the minus N, where N is, of course, the, the thing I'm going to let vary. That's the thing that will go off to infinity. So a more geometric way of thinking about this is that I'm taking P1 of CP, and I'm taking away open piadic disks around all of the rational numbers in P1 of Q. And uh, the radius of these disks is going to get smaller and smaller. So at step 0, I'm going to take away P plus 1 disks around P1C with radius 1. And then at the next step, it's going to be P times as many with radius 1 over P those. And so there's more and more disks of smaller and smaller radius that I keep taking away to get to the actual uh, piadic upper half plane. Now, it's a rigid analytic space. Uh, that's really the category that it lives in. And this covering HP less than or equal to N is an admissible covering by affinoids. If you don't know what that means, it's not so bad. You can think of it just on the level of points. The CP points of the piadic upper half plane are just the CP points of P1, where I take away the QP points of P1. Yeah? And you can think by analogy, and this is, explains also the name of this space, if you take, uh, if you take P1 of C... Oh, that's in the shadow. Oh, thank you. All right. No, no, that's fine, that's fine. It's, it's very quick. So uh, if instead of this non-Archimedean field, I would take C, so if you think of P1 of C minus P1 of R, which would be the Archimedean analog of that, what you would get is sort of the, the union of the upper and lower half planes. Uh, and so usually in the theory, except when you forget to say that A is greater than 0 and D less than zero, so the, the thing I forgot to say last time, that's the same as forgetting to discard one of the two half planes. So usually we work just with the upper half plane, which contains the first roots of the positive definite uh, quadratic forms, and then the lower half plane contains the first roots of the negative definite uh, roots. So this is kind of why in the Archimedean case you get the union of the upper and lower half planes. In the non-Archimedean case, when you take P1CP and you take away P1QP, it's still connected, so the upper and lower half planes are kind of blended together in some in some interesting way uh, that you don't see in this uh, non-Archimedean setup. So, so maybe the upper half plane is a slightly bad name, but that, that is what people use. So, uh, so that's what I'll use also. Now, here's a note. It contains points of CP that are not in QP. Yeah? So they're not QP rational. In particular, it contains the first roots of the quadratic forms with positive discriminant, I should have said, well, actually, it doesn't matter. I shouldn't have said that. So just quadratic forms with, uh, I guess, non-squared discriminant, uh, even that I don't have to say, just quadratic forms of discriminant D that satisfy the condition that this uh, particular Kronecker symbol is minus 1. So that P is not a square in the... Uh, in the um, so that P is, not, uh, P, P is inert, let's say, in the order associated to D. If you have this condition, then you know that the first root is not going to lie in QP, so it's going to lie in this piadic upper half. And of course, all of this is implicit with uh, 
a fixed choice of embeddings of Q-bar both into C and into CP, which I fixed once and for all at the beginning without telling you. Yeah? So it contains those roots, and that's an important observation for later on. Now, if you're more visually inclined, you can think of this piatic upper half plane as a tubular neighborhood of, uh, again, a tree, not the topograph this time, but a uh, Bruja Titz tree. The Bruja Titz tree is a P plus one regular tree um, whose vertices classify homotopy classes of lattices in, in QP squared. And this, uh, there's a natural map from the upper half plane to this tree, which gives you a convenient way of visualizing the piatic upper half plane. Again, you can read more in this Arizona Winter School volume about all of these details, but it's a convenient way of visualizing it. And so you see on this picture here, I guess P is two in this picture. I stole this picture from Mark Masdeo. It's a very nice picture. Uh, P is equal to two, I guess, in this picture. And what's happening is that this, this is kind of HP less than or equal to two, I guess, in this picture. So you've taken a, a bunch of disks at the ends there, and what remains is kind of this tubular neighborhood of the Bruja Titz tree. So it's, a, it's one step of this process, and you can keep repeating it like a fractal, which comes down to taking this limit, and in the limit you get HP. Absolutely. Ah, so HP is the, it's the rigid analytic space, let's say. So it's a, it's a geometric object, and HP of CP is the CP points of that space. So, uh, yes, it's in fact defined over QP, but for us it'll suffice to just view it as originality space over CP. It doesn't really matter for. Yes, precisely, absolutely. So you can ask for HP of QP, and that's empty. There's no QP points in this space. There are, however, lots of QP squared points, where QP squared is the um, unramified quadratic extension, let's say, of QP. Uh, and so in every extension, we find lots of points, but in QP itself, the, this, the set of points is empty. Yeah. Okay. So this M, the meromorphic functions on this space, again, is something very concrete. Uh, what it'll mean for us is it's uniform limits of rational functions on this affinoid covering. So that means that if I restrict a meromorphic function to any of these affinoids, it's going to be a uniform limit of rational functions on that affinoid. And this should be true for any n. So that's, that's the definition of it, of uh, meromorphic functions. OK, so essentially you know what's coming now, and this is what I'll end the lecture with. I've already announced all of these steps, and we went through them in great detail on the special, very concrete baby case of rational functions. Now it's this same story on steroids, but with rational functions replaced by um, meromorphic functions on the piatic upper half plane. So it's the same steps, except everything is slightly richer. So the group now is richer. It's SL2Z1 over P. Again, we take a cusp, C, and in fact, let me just take infinity, because why not? It doesn't matter all that much. I'm going to choose a quadratic form F with positive discriminant that is not a square mod P, or at least that the Kronecker symbol over P is minus 1. If I have this, the first step was to consider interesting uh, additive co-cycles. Yeah? So co-cycles valued in the weight 2 module of meromorphic functions defined in exactly the same way as before uh, with the weight 2 action. So that additive co-cycle is going to be inspired by this Knopp co-cycle, and this time it's going to be sum over the gamma orbit of F. That's what the subscript here is saying. So I'm letting gamma act on these forms. Yeah? So these forms, I mean, I guess they could have p's in the denominator, they have rational coefficients. Um, so, uh, but, but it doesn't really matter. So you can take this sum. It's still, of course, an infinite orbit. It contains the index of this set, contains the SL2Z orbit, but it contains even much more. What I'll do is I'll make this uh, rational function in precisely the same way as before, except the index set has changed here. And it turns out that when I do this, I get a meromorphic function. Now, it's very important to note that this sum here, unlike what happened before, is an infinite sum. That's very important. We have to be allowed to converge to something interesting piatic because we need infinite sums. The sum here is infinite. The reason that it converges is because the divisor, so the, the set of poles that I've introduced here, it's infinite, but it's discrete in HP. So it kind of converges to the boundary. And at every finite stage, if I restrict to any affinoid with a fixed n, I get finitely many poles. Yeah? So this thing makes sense only as a meromorphic function, no longer as a rational function. The second step was to define multiplicative lifts, which nothing new is happening. It's exactly the same as before. Formally, I write down this infinite product where I just 
multiplicatively integrate everything entirely formally. There's one little subtlety that I'm glossing over here. In order to make this product converge, this converges already, but this product, you have to be a little bit careful. So you have to, the factors that I put there, you have to put a, a precise, well, you have to put some constant in, a damping constant, to make this infinite product converge to a meromorphic function. The reason I'm glossing over this is because it's entirely irrelevant what constants I put in, because the only thing I'm interested in is the co-cycle modulo scalars. Yeah, so I'm only assuring convergence, and then the scalar I, d I don't really care about, so that's why I gloss over this. Yeah. So that's the multiplicative lift of this thing. So again, we want to play the same game. We want to lift it now to a co-cycle valued in M star, not just modulo scalar ambiguity. Alas, you can never do that. So the group SL2Z was cohomologically quite poor, but the group gamma is cohomologically much richer. And the H2 that I have there on the left is decidedly non-zero. It is something you can appreciate. It's essentially isomorphic up to torsion to H1 of gamma zero of P with values in CP star. So a group that is very closely related to modular forms. But the lifting obstruction is never going to be zero. And that's, that's life. So you might think, OK, game over then. Uh, I guess. Uh, we're done, how do we define a value? We have to lift it multiplicatively first. But the, the thing is, it doesn't really matter. If you want to evaluate it at a form G that satisfies these usual conditions, then we're just going to restrict this co-cycle to SL2Z, where we know we can lift, or we can lift uniquely after taking a 12th power, and then evaluate at the automorph of this form gamma G, which is in SL2Z, the standard copy of SL2Z inside of SL2Z1 over P. So we want to evaluate it at some element which happens to lie in the standard copy of SL2Z inside of this group. And so there's no lifting obstruction at all. And that's precisely what we'll do. So we'll define this. And I'll just finish with this. I'll say that after all of these definitions, uh, we have this quantity. You have a naive kind of algorithm for computing this using only what I've told you. But that algorithm would be exponential in the required precision for computing this quantity. So in our paper, we find a, 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 an algorithm that is actually polynomial time in the required precision. And I just want to send you off with one example. And I'll tell you that uh, next time, we'll explore this further and further and further. So historically, this was the first time we ever computed an example. This is the first one I could find in my records, where we did this whole procedure with all these bizarre co-cycles. Out comes a number, and we recognize this number as 24 square root of minus 1 minus 7 over 25. So, an algebraic number has appeared, hallelujah. So next time, we're going to explore them much further. And uh, so already, I hope that this gives you some idea as to why all of these bizarre definitions make sense. And we'll really dig into them and get their fine-tuned arithmetic in the next lecture next time. So thanks very much. Uh,